Well, this is our prophecy update. And uh, um, how many of you have never been to a prophecy update before? Raise your hands. Okay, quite a few of you. Basically what I do is I just go through um, some of the things uh, that you see in the Bible um, concerning the last days and uh, show how our culture is going in that direction. And so one of the, you know, one of the basic ones that I always like, a kick, like to kick around is the uh, cashless society. And so we live in a, uh, in a world where we are quickly uh, devolving from using cash and we're going to digital currencies and, and that kind of thing. And it's something that the Bible predicted. The Bible predicts that uh, there's coming a time when uh, uh, nobody can buy or sell without a mark that's given to them by a world dictator who the Bible calls the beast. And so, you know, it, it's that kind of thing. Well, there are a number of uh, different issues that come up when you, when you look at your Bible um, as far as uh, how the last days go. And um, all of those, you know, a lot of those issues are, are things that we deal with in normal everyday life. And um, it's getting more and more intense as uh, time goes on. Some of those things have to do with technology. Some of those things have to do with society and uh, specifically societal change. And so that's uh, some of the stuff that we're going we're gonna to be talking about tonight um, is specifically societal change. The reason is because... Um, I was talking uh, with my um, assistant pastors um, a few weeks ago when we were talking about the prophecy update, and they wanted me to deal with uh, issues that are in the news. And so uh, some of the things that have to do with racial politics, some of the things that have to do climate change is the first thing that I'm going to talk about, uh, um, and uh, some of the decay that you see in, in society as far as um, the American society is uh, looking more and more like we're going to be at each other's throats um, as time goes on. And uh, what does that have to do with Bible prophecy? And what, it, what, uh, what does the Bible predict about those kinds of things? So that's what I'm going to be talking about. So I'm going to be uh, dealing with some of those issues that you read about in the newspaper every single day and uh, showing you what, um, what actually is going on and what Scripture has to say. I am a Christian, obviously, and I believe the Bible, obviously. And I come from a worldview. Uh, uh, actually, I don't come from a worldview. I come from a liberal world worldview. And my mind got changed in a number of areas as I became a Christian. And so uh, before I was a Christian, I, I was somebody uh, who believed that the government should be in control of lots of stuff. And I believed that abortion was good. And I believed that uh, um, somebody else should pay for my health insurance. And I believe, you know, you can go down the, down through the list. And that's the, that's the place where I came from. And uh, then I became a Christian and I started seeing that uh, the Bible had some different things to say about that. And especially about the way that I, I lead my life and, and the way that I live it. And so there's a number of things that I'm going to be talking about. And some of the stuff that, uh, that I'm going to be talking about tonight um, is stuff that may torque you off. <laughs> and I'm not doing it to, to make you mad or anything. Um, I'm, I'm just letting you know, uh, you know, right from the get-go um, that um, the Bible has some things to say about some of the stuff that we do in our, in our culture and in our society, and uh, what the Bible has to say about it is not good. It's not good. And I agree with what God says. And that's, that's been a change of, of my mind over time. Uh, some of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about, especially when, when you're talking about uh, subjects like climate change and, and some of the other issues that we're going to deal with, I have opinions. And um, I form my opinions based on the information that I get and that kind of thing. And so I'm going to do my best to give you some good information, at least give you a good idea of, of what, the, what the issues are and uh, that, kind of, that kind of stuff. So with that, let's pray and uh, we'll get into it. Father, we just uh, want to come before you and just pray that uh, the time that we spend here would uh, just be productive. Lord, we thank you that we're living in exciting times. We're living in the, in the times that, that you called the, uh, the times of the Gentiles and uh, the, end, the end days, the last days. And it's pretty evident uh, by the things that are going on around us and by what the Bible has to say. And so, Lord, as we go through and we, uh, we look at some of these issues, some of them are pretty complex, and I'm going to have to simplify them in ways that I don't really like to do. But, um, uh, God, I just pray that you'd help me to uh, be able to explain them um, uh, reasonably. 
And uh, Father, that um, as we go through these things, that um, our uh, faith in you would just increase and uh, that we'd be looking up, that we'd be looking up expectantly. Just ask that you do this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, if you got a Bible, um, I'm going to read to you from a passage out of the book of Revelation, and this is in Revelation chapter 16. And in that passage, um, this is, this is a, a, actually a third series of judgments that the uh, book of Revelation talks about, and it's specifically judgments that are poured out on the earth that I'm going to be talking about. In uh, chapter 16, and verse 3, it says, Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things, for they've shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you've given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has power over these, these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they, gnar- they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and did not repent of their deeds. And it goes on, there's some more uh, judgments that are in there, but these are some of the ones that I wanted to talk about. And so I want to um, I want to talk about climate change. And I, w- I want to tell you that um, right off the bat, obviously, the Bible talks about a, a period of time when the sun is going to be sor- scorching men with great heat. And so the Bible talks about um, global warming, talks about global warming. Um, but I'm, I'm one of those guys who, um, well, I, the, the reason I'm telling you this is because I'm letting you know that um, when I look at the whole climate change argument, if I knew for sure that there was some substance to it, I would be all over it, okay? And I don't know for sure that there's not any substance to it. Um, I'm still I'm still checking things out. But what I want you what I, what I want to let you know is that when we're talking about some of the things that are going on with climate change and global warming and the things that are uh, that um, people are saying about it, um, I'm not seeing the science. I'm I'm seeing a lot of um, arguments and I'm seeing a lot of name calling. And I'm seeing a lot of uh, um, um, arguments from authority instead of arguments from science. And that always bugs me. That always bugs me. And so um, I just wanted to go through and and talk about this a little bit and give you some uh, perspectives on it. And I'm not going to be able to go into radical detail because I've already tried this with my wife. (laughs) And I've tried it with a couple other people. And so I'm just going to try to keep it simple. Okay. So what about climate change? Oh, come on! <laughs> okay, this is, this is the atmosphere. That's a pie chart of the atmosphere. This right here is nitrogen. This right here is oxygen. That yellow strip there is argon. And see the, the, these little pointers right here? Those right there? That's these little pointers right here. And they are pointing to a strip that you can't see on there. And that's CO2. Actually, that's not even just CO2. That little strip there that you can't see is made up of CO2 and neon and helium and methane and hydrogen and and that kind of stuff. Those are called trace gases. And so when when you are talking about the part of the atmosphere that contains carbon dioxide, which is what the whole global warming thing is all about, When you're talking about that part of the atmosphere, you're talking about less than 1% of the atmosphere, okay? So this whole whole little pie right here is 0.04338% of the atmosphere, okay? 1% would be 1.0, okay? So you're you're talking 400 parts per million. Uh, It's 400 
you know, 433,000, you know, what, whatever, parts per million. That means each part to a million parts. So you take a million atoms and 400 of them are going to be these trace gases. Okay? That clears mud? Okay, so that, that's, the, that's the stuff that we're talking about. Here's, a, here's the next slide. And this is, uh, you know what, I, I don't need to go there. Let me, let me first talk about how global warming um, happens. You guys know about the greenhouse effect, right? And so where they get that from is if you stand in a greenhouse in the middle of winter, the glass is trapping the radiation that's com coming from the sun and it'll be warmer on the inside of the greenhouse than it is on the outside. You get this on the southern exposure of your houses. You open a window during the winter and it's a sunny day and it can be warm inside by there um, at that point. There, there's some problems with that, that whole analogy that I just gave you because it's not that simple. It's not that simple. Basically, yeah, it's not that simple. When you're, talking about heat, when you're talking about heat transfer, it comes in, bounces, you know, goes through the app. Or, you know, when, when, when you're talking about, um, for example, uh, the sun's effect on the moon, you can stand on the moon and get over 200 degrees. Um, but um, when, when, you're, when you're talking on the sunshine side, but then you can get all, almost down to absolute zero on the, on the night side. And if you stand in the shadow on the sun side, you're at, ab at almost absolute zero. And so basically everything that's hitting, hitting the, the moon is being re-radiated out. When you add an atmosphere, some of that bounces back, but it always gets out, always gets back out. And when you, when you start adding more gases in the atmosphere and what are called greenhouse gases, greenhouse gases are gases that trap um, or help, uh, that's not even right, but they help to trap the, the heat. And so you add greenhouse gases and it warms up. And if you take them away, it cools off, basically. So that's a, that's a short version. And all you, all you scientific nuts, I, I, you could come up and explain it better than me. <laughs> you could, but I'm trying to keep it simple. Okay, these are greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So I was just talking about um, CO2. CO2 is carbon dioxide. Um, carbon dioxide is what you breathe out. So you breathe, you breathe in oxygen, nitrogen, and one of the things you breathe, breathe out is carbon dioxide. So um, what they're doing now is they're calling car carbon dioxide a pollutant. And so all of you are polluting the atmosphere right now. Okay, that's, that's kind of messed up thinking. And so I don't like that when, when somebody tells me stuff like that. When, uh, when you're talking about every animal on the planet, they are all breathing out CO2. And so they are all polluting the atmosphere if CO2 is a pollutant. CO2 also comes from the, from the burning of hydrocarbons because you have carbon and you have oxygen that are put in those things. When you put carbon and oxygen together, you can get CO2. It's carbon and oxygen. One carbon atom, two, two oxygen atoms, right? Okay, and so, so that's what happens when you burn hydrocarbons. When I was a kid, uh, they had smog down in Southern California, and one of the things that they did uh, because of the, the smog, uh, cars were putting out carbon monoxide. So that's one carbon atom, one oxygen atom, and that stuff will kill you. That is a pollutant. And so what they did was they added what are called catalytic converters to your exhaust, and what that did was it, uh, com it through a chemical process, it took carbon monoxide, added an another oxygen atom, and made it carbon dioxide. And the idea behind that is that we're, we're, instead of pouring out poisons from our car exhaust, we're pouring out plant food. Because carbon dioxide is something that plants take in so that they can live. That's the process of photosynthesis. So we breathe in oxygen, they breathe, or yeah, we breathe in oxygen, we breathe out CO2, they breathe in CO2, they breathe out oxygen. And so that's the, that's the cycle. That's the atmospheric cycle. And that's real, really simplified too. Well, when, we, when you're talking about CO2, CO2 is a um, greenhouse gas and it will help to trap heat. Um, but when you're talking about greenhouse gases, the, the, the major greenhouse gas on this planet is water vapor. So 95% of the water vapor is 95% of the greenhouse gases that we've got on the planet. It has 95% or um, actually upward of 90 or uh, 80%. No, 
yeah, 85 percent, 66 to 85 percent of uh, greenhouse effect comes from water vapor, not from CO2. Okay, and so when I when I first was hearing about this stuff, I was like, okay, you you know, when you're when you're talking about um, atmospheric CO2 and that going up. You have to you have to understand that water vapor is the is the major component in greenhouse in the greenhouse effect, and and so why are we talking CO two? Now one of the things that CO two will do is it'll obviously warm things up, and when you warm things up, you get more water vapor, and so there's kind of a po it's called a positive feedback effect. So the more you warm the planet, the more water vapor you get because the oceans get warmer and the land gets warmer and all that stuff. That causes the evaporation you get and you get more um, water vapor. And so that can um, compound the effect of CO2. Okay, sorry, sorry to make this a big science lesson, but that's some of the stuff that, that people are arguing about. And I won't get way, way more into that, but basically when, when you're looking at, at these issues, they think that CO2 is uh, about 3.6% 3. 3 of the gases that are causing um, the greenhouse effect, water vapor being about 95%, and the other is um, other gases like methane. Methane does the same thing as CO2, basically. Different, different uh, amount of effect, but you have that. So 80% of uh, total greenhouse gas mass is um, water, 90% to 95% is, of the green gas, uh, greenhouse gas volume is going to be water vapor, um, and uh, it accounts for um, anywhere from 66 to 85 percent of the greenhouse effect, compared to a range of 9 percent to 26 percent for CO2. And that right there causes me issues. Why don't we know? I mean, you know, I, I can see the reason for the for the difference uh, for the range in in the greenhouse effect of water because water is not um, uh, distributed evenly throughout the atmosphere. So when you have higher humidity areas, you're going to have a bigger greenhouse effect because you have more water in the atmosphere. When you're in a drier area, you have less of that because, uh, again, you're in a drier atmosphere. This whole, this whole range here causes me some problems. Okay, and so that's that's another one of those things that that I check out when I was first introduced to this, the whole issue of uh, global warming. It was uh, back in the late '90s, early 2000s, and a report came out um, from the intergovernmental. Uh, oh, it's the IPCC. I can't remember what the P is for. Uh, anybody know? Panel, um, intergovernmental intergovernmental panel on uh, climate change. And this is called man's hockey stick. And what we have here is these are dates down on the bottom. Uh, these are temperatures. And so you, you have a negative temperature. This is in, this is in uh, C, and so uh, centigrade. And so you have a ne negative temperature of about oh, 2.5 right here, and it's going to down to about negative, uh, what would that be, about negative 3 or so. And then it's climbing up here to 0, and then it's climbing up, uh, this direction. And so this is called man's hockey stick. Um, 1000 BC, 1200 BC, 1400 BC, 1600 BC, 1800 BC, and you see this climb uh, right around 1900, uh, I said BC, I mean AD, um, 1900 AD, okay? And so this is the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and you see this climb here in temperatures. And where they got this from was reconstructions from uh, it's called dendrochronology uh, um, from plants, from trees, okay, stuff like that, and ice cores and, and, and that kind of thing. And so this is where they got the, these numbers from. Okay, immediately, um, I'm, I'm a science guy. I like science, and I paid attention when I was in school, and I know, and I, know I like history too, and so I know th some things about science and history. And so one of the things that I know is that from... Uh, you know, um, up until, you know, from about 14, 1500 up until about 1760, there was a period of time called the Little Ice Age where temperatures went down in Europe and in North America. And this is stuff that we know historically. Um, we know about it because people wrote about it. And then you have another period of time that was called the med medieval warm uh, uh, climate or the medieval warm uh, period. And that happened right about back in here. 
And what you see here is a trend line that goes down, 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 down. And it's an, even though you have these ups and downs here, this is an even trend line that's going all the way up to 1900. And um, what you don't see in here is the medieval warm period, and you don't see the little ice age sitting here. It's just a, it's just a, a straight trend line. As soon as I saw that, I was like, something's wrong with the graph, because we know that historically. And so what they tried to say was that uh, histori you know, historicity didn't really matter because that was uh, something that was just based on locality. And so the Vikings, for example, um, colonized Greenland. And it's not until just lately that some of their colonies are coming out from under the ice. Because what happened was they got to Greenland and, and um, there were places to live uh, there, and so they colonized it, and then it got cold because of the Little Ice Age, and uh, um, just overwhelmed them, and they got out of Dodge, basically, went over to Iceland, okay? And so, um, we kn again, we know this stuff historically. And so, what they tried to say was that it was something that was just localized, and um, again, um, you know, I kind of have some problems with that. And so, um, and I'm going to give you some reasons for that. This is This is the uh, climate change 2001, the scientific basis. This is the IPCC report, and this is man's hockey stick. Okay. So, global cli climate during the millennium. Um, I am, uh, uh, I, I got a lot of these graphs and stuff that I'm going to show you from a guy named Howard Cork Hayden. And he's a professor of physics uh, emeritus in the physics department of the University of Connecticut. And um, um, I, uh, took some of some of his graphs um, from a presentation where he did a debate with a climate alarmist, and so these are these are some of his graphs. Now, one of the things that I'm going to be doing here is I I'm I'm a um, I'm a creationist. I believe what the Bible says about how we got here, but when I'm talking with somebody who believes in long ages for the earth, for example, because they believe in long ages for the earth, I get to use all their information. So I'm going to argue with them on their level. And this is what I do with, with, with people just in general. If they've, got, if they've got a certain worldview, I don't have a problem using their worldview to show them that what they're doing is contradicting themselves. And this is, this is one of the things that you have with this whole thing. So I don't want you to freak out here, but this is the last half billion years of, of CO2, atmospheric CO2 um, content. Okay, And so this, again, is coming from some of the same things that man got his, uh, man is the scientist that did that hockey stick graph. Oh, I didn't explain that. My wife wanted me to explain this. The reason it's called the hockey stick is because it goes like this and then goes like this. And if you turn that up, that looks like a hockey stick. Okay, so that's where it comes from. So if, if you're weirded out about that, is that good, Bobby? Okay. Okay, saw right off, okay. So when, when you're looking at this graph right here, um, what, what you have here is um, the global temperatures, this blue line right here that goes like this, okay? And this is CO2. This is carbon dioxide, okay? These are, what's called, these are what are called parts per million. And again, that means you take a million atoms of the atmosphere, and right now, here's where we are right here, you, get, you take a million atoms of the atmosphere, you're going to get about 400 atoms of carbon dioxide, or excuse me, molecules of carbon dioxide. Okay? And so when, when you go back in history and you look at where the carbon dioxide levels um, are in ancient times, when you're talking about the, the lowest levels of the of the Earth that has life in it, you have carbon dioxide levels of almost 7,000 parts per million. Um, they're talking right now about catastrophic global warming if we reach 560 parts per million. Okay, not 7,000, 560 parts per million. And it goes down. And you, you get over here, and, and starting in the, in the Silurian, the Devonian, and all the way up here to the, uh, to the uh, Jurassic, um, and uh, even somewhat into the Cretaceous, you have the dinosaur age. And so the, so the CO2 goes down, and the, the temperature goes down and goes up 
It goes down and goes up, but you see CO2 going down. And during the, the time of the dinosaurs, this is, this is the time of T-Rex and all those guys, you got anywhere from about 2,000 parts per million to about 2,500 parts per million CO2. And again, we're, that, that's far beyond 560 parts per million that they're worrying about. And then after you get past the dinosaur age, you have uh, this, this period of time right in here where you have the ice age and CO2 starts going down, 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 way down. And we're right down in here. Okay? And so this is the half billion, the, the last half billion years on the planet. These are CO2 um, uh, 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 this is atmospheric CO2 and how much there, there is in the atmosphere for that whole period of time. And for the majority of that, that period of time, uh, if you took a, a, a mean on this, you'd be right around 3,500, not 560, okay? Here, here's, here's another graph on, uh, again, time scales, and you're talking about a half billion years ago, and it's 25 times the present uh, um, concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And if you're just talking about down uh, back by uh, the time of the dinosaurs right in here, right in here, you're talking about 10, 10 times the amount of CO2. That's during the dinosaur time. And so you don't have a situation where you can look back in the past and see these high concentrations of CO2 and see the earth burning up and everybody dying on it. And so that's, that's one of the things that you have. Here's another thing. This is the last 10,000 years. And so this comes from Greenland Ice Course. And this, is, this has to do with statistics, basically, and how you can tell a story from a graph. And one of the things that you have to watch out for when you're, when you're looking at um, information uh, that comes from people is you have to watch for agendas. And so this, this graph has the temperature in degrees on the right-hand side, and then um, it's got the period of time for the last 10,000 years sitting on the bottom, okay? And so again, these are from Greenland um, ice cores. And when you get down here, you have a low, low end spike that's right here. You have a low end spike that's right here about 4,700 years ago. You have another low end spike that's here about uh, 1,200 years ago. This is the little ice age right here. And so you get this period of time um, uh, you know, up to about uh, 700 years ago that come up to almost modern times. And then here we are right here. And that's where the average temperature is at this point. And so if all my, if all my reference points are from the low end spikes, that's what you see here, then what you've got is a situation where you can prove that the earth is warming. But in reality, what you have here is you have all these spikes that are going up here. And so if you're, if you're going to do a graph, a line graph, that line graph is going to do something like this. And it's going like, to be like this, but it's going to stay above this line right here, this thir ne uh, negative 31.5 right here. It's going to stay above this line all the way along the graph, and it's going to go down when you get to the end of it. And so depending on what, what your starting points are, that's, good, that's going to tell you whether you're, you know, I mean, you can make this graph say that you're warming or you can make the graph say that it's cooling. And that's really the problem with, with a lot of the situations that you have with this. Okay, again, the hockey stick. So I'm sitting here looking at this hockey stick and, and this is too even. It's too even. And it, it doesn't have certain things in it and that's one of the points that, that was made by Mr. Hayden, there is no medieval warm period, which was 900 to 1300, and there is no little ice age, which was 1680 to 1850. Actually, um, most guys I know um, uh, will even put it back to 1760 is when it's really started warming up. And so what we should see is something that looks like this. There's a medieval warm period, there's a little ice age, and there's this. And, and so what it should, should be doing is going like this, going back down like this, and then going back up like this. And that's history. And so since, the, since this graph came out, what's happened is uh, there have been scientists, um, meteorologists who have gone, gone back and they have looked at the whole issue of whether or not this was just local climate or whether or not it was a war worldwide warm climate. There's been a couple hundred papers that, are, that have been put out um, stating that, um, proving that the, the medieval warm period and the little ice age were something that was global, okay? And so again, you have an issue there, 
Okay. Um, here's another thing. Um, this is from an MIT uh, paper, and I'm just going to read it to you. It says, a prime piece of evidence linking human activity to climate change turns out to be an artifact of poor mathematics. And this is by Richard Muller of MIT Technology Review. In a scientific and political debate over global warming, warming, the latest wrong piece may be the hockey stick, the famous plot published by University of Massachusetts geoscientist Michael Mann. He's now in uh, um, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, Michael Mann and colleagues, this plot purports to show that we are now experiencing, experiencing the warm, warmest climate in a millennium. Sorry, I can't talk. And that the earth, after remaining cool for centuries during the medieval era, suddenly began to heat up about 100 years ago, just at the time that the burning of coal and oil led to an increase in atmospheric levels of carbon dioxide. Canadian scientists Stephen McIntyre and Ross McKittrick have uncovered a fundamental mathematical flaw in the computer program that was used to produce the hockey stick. In his original publications of the stick, man purported to use a standard method known as the Principal Component Analysis, or PCA, to find the dominant features um, in a set of more than 70 different climate records, but it wasn't so. McIntyre and McKittrick obtained part of the program that man used, and they found serious problems. Not only does the program not do conventional PCA, but it handles data normalization in a way that can only be described as mistaken. Now comes the real shocker. This improper normalization procedure tends to emphasize any data that do have the hockey stick shape and to suppress all data that do not. To demonstrate this effect, McIntyre and McKittrick created some meaningless test data that had on average no trends. This method of generating random data is called Monte Carlo analysis after the famous casino, and it is widely used in statistical analysis to test procedures. When McKittrick, M McIntyre and McKittrick fed these random data into the man procedure, out popped a hockey stick shape. This is what this means. They put static into the computer, and it made a hockey stick. And so you can't do that. You can't do that. If you put static into a computer, you should get static back out. And, and basically, I'm talking about data lines. That's what you should get back out. And, and so there was a problem with, with that whole thing. Okay. And so I never went for the man hockey stick. And that one, that one's been kind of put to the side. And, uh, climate scientists don't like to really talk about that a whole lot anymore, but that's where that one's at. Here's another thing. One of the things that you run into when you're talking about uh, climate change, when, when people are talking about it, is they worry about drought. So there's been, you know, a couple of year drought down in uh, California. You know, I don't know, I would think it was a four year drought or something like that. And everybody's going, it's all about global warming. And there, you know, we've had some, some issues with droughts in Washington about global warming. I just heard about a tree that died in an arboretum over in, in uh, Seattle. It's all about global warming. It's why the tree died and, you know, um, that kind of stuff. Well, when you look at droughts through history, and again, this is, this is using the same metric that they use in other issues. And so what they're, what they're doing is they're taking tree, tree ring evidence from, from the Southwest. And when you take tree ring um, evidence from the Southwest, this is where we are right here, um, a little past the, the 21st century mark. And they've got tree ring evidence that goes all the way back to about um, 800 AD. And what you get is 200 year droughts. So this right here, is a 200-year drought. Here's another one. And these are huge. This, this one's about 100 years, and this one's about a 50-year drought. So we had big droughts back in the American Southwest that make our droughts look stupid. This is, a little, this is our little dinky drought right here. Here's another little dinky drought when California became a state, and this is, this is wetter weather. And so, again, when, when you're looking at man-made global warming, and that's what it's called, anthropogenic global warming. It means man-made global warming. All of the man-made global warming, warming has to start right about here. Okay? And so we have, a, we have a wet period up until we get about into the mid-20th century, and, and that's the Dust Bowl period. And then we have, and it's a drier period, and then it gets a little bit more wet, and then we have a drought period right there. And it doesn't compare with any of this stuff. And so man-made CO2 started right here. So how did all this happen? And that's the problem. There is climate change. There's climate change all the time. It's a matter of whether the, um, the uh, you know, one to three percent of extra carbon dioxide that mankind is putting in the atmosphere is actually causing major differences in climate change. And that's the question. And so um, the argument is that it is, and many times what will happen is people will point at weather 
to prove climate change. And so when you hear about a hurricane, and a hurricane's a bad one, and people go, it, that's, that's climate change. That's, that's just nonsense. That's, that's not climate, that's weather. That was a storm, okay? And so vice versa. We just had the big, a big cold snap back east, right? And so one of the things that, that, um, that uh, people like to do is go, well, where's the, you know, where's the global warming? I'd like some now, and that kind of stuff. And again, that's weather. That's not climate change. What you have to do is you have to look at the weather over a long period of time. You see trends, and that's, when you're, that's where you're going to get some, some climate change. Okay, so one of the things that, that um, climate change guys bring up is glacial retreat. Okay, so this is something that can be measured. And so I like this stuff. And so if I'm, if I'm going to, if I'm going to find out if this is a for real issue and, and that kind of stuff, then I can, I can look at this and, and see this stuff. And fortunately, again, we have history. And so there's been a period of time where people have been looking at glaciers. And here's an example. This is out of Glacier Bay in Alaska. And so it's from 1760 to the present. And see these, see these little white areas right there? Those are the glaciers as they sit right now. That's, that's where they're at. So you got one there, 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 you know, all, all the way up here. Down here, between 1760 and 1780, we know from history that the glaciers filled all of Glacier Bay. So the glaciers were all the way down to here. By 1794, they'd retreated to this, this far. By 1845, they'd retreated here. 1857, you've got, it, got them up here. 1860, the glaciers have retreated here. We haven't reached the industrial age yet. So nobody, nobody's burned a bunch of coal and oil yet. And, and so the Industrial Revolution hasn't taken place. And you have this much melting that's taken place between 1760 and 1860. That can't be because of CO2. That has to be because of something else. Then you go 1860, 1880, 1892, 1907, uh, 1948. And over here you got 1879, 1892, 1912. 1920 is when they think that most of the CO2 started getting pumped in the atmosphere. Okay, so you have all this melting in Glacier Bay that was taking place that was long before any, any atmospheric CO2 caused by man-made um, situations could have any effect on this stuff. And again, that's something that you can look at. So, 44 presidents, actually it's 45 now, 45 presidents have seen glacier decline. George Washington watched the glaciers go back all the way up until modern times. And, and so, again, when, when you're talking about this, there is climate change, and obviously things are warming up. And so this is, this is evidence of warming, but the warming has been going on long before the Industrial Age. And, and that, that, again, is the issue. Okay, then this is one of the things, and I, I didn't put a bunch of graphics in here, but this is one of the things that I'm really interested in. I look at this every single year. I, uh, you know, I'm interested in, in the North Pole and the ice cap and all that stuff. So I, I have a webpage I go to every single year in September, and I'm going to check it out here in January too because it's going to reach extents and, and that kind of stuff. And what they've been talking about is the, is the North uh, Polar cap is disappearing. And it was supposed to be gone by, I think it was 2012, wasn't it? Wasn't it, yeah, it was supposed to be gone by 2012, but no, it wasn't. And here's one of the things that you need to understand about this. They're measuring the ice cap based on satellite data. And so they've got satellites that are taking pictures of it. And they, so they measure the extents and, you know, they, they get the average area and all, all that kind of stuff. That's what they're looking at. Okay, well, satellites have only been measuring that since 1979. And from about the 1950s, all the way up until the 1970s, you had a period of time where, the, where again, the weather was cooling. In fact, um, you probably heard famously about back in the 1970s, they were talking about the next ice age. I remember that when I was a kid because guys like me got up and said, oh, there's an ice age coming, and they tried to put it in the Bible and you know, that kind of stuff. And, and so I, I remember that, you know, the big, the big thing about that. And so 1979 was when the ice sheet probably got to its largest extent in modern times. And so every measurement since that point has been after the ice sheet got to its largest extent. And so when they're, when you're, they're giving you those numbers, you just have to know that. So is it smaller than 1979? Yeah, but 1979 came after a cooling period. And so when you're, when you're talking about the extent of the ice sheet, it's only been between, you know, right around 5% difference 
um, from 1979. Five, it's, it's not over 10%, and it's for sure mostly around 5% difference. And what we have is a warming period that's been taking place since 79 all the way up till 1998. Okay? And so you have to understand that. You get that? So if it's, if, if it's already the biggest it was in modern times, and then you start warming up and it starts getting smaller and going, you know, doing this kind of stuff, well, we don't have a way to compare it to 1940 or 1920, not in the, not in the same exact way. We, we know anecdotally from histories where things were, but we don't, we don't have those kinds of measurements. They only go back to 1979. Okay, here's another one, Arctic temperature. And so the Arctic is warming up, and that's not debatable. It is warming up. And so this is the Arctic temperature anomaly. And so in this chart, this starts about 1957, and you can see that this graph, there's a trend, and that trend is going up, right? Okay, and so that's from 1957 until um, really close to the present, about 19, uh, 20, 2015, 2016. I don't, I don't know what the date was. Okay, now here's the problem with this stuff. When you're looking at these things, you need to, you need, you're, you're getting a sampling of the, of the temperature. Here's the next one. Here's the graph that I just showed you with the upward trend, and here's the graph since 1920. And so that upward trend starts right here, and that's that part of the graph. Well, here it is back in the 40s, and these are temperatures. We had temperature data from, from, from these areas. And so you can see right here that the temperature is warmer right here, um, but the temperature was even more warm back in the 1940s and back in the 1930s. And so that, if, if you don't put that information in the graph, you can make it look like something that it's actually not. So is there a warming trend? Yes, there's a warming trend. Is it warmer than the 1940s? No, it's not. And again, we know that, we know that um, historically too. Um, Newsweek um, from 1880 to 1970. This is another one of those things you know, where, where you're seeing a graph. And so from 1880 to 1970, this is how the temperatures went. And this is when they were saying an ice age is imminent. And again, when you're, when you're looking at graphs, you have to understand that what we're talking about is less than one degree Fahrenheit. That's the first thing. That's less than one degree. And this is from 1880 to 1970. That's almost 100 years. So basically what they did with that graph is they took it. It should be like this long if you're going if, if to do you know, uh, kind of ratios that, that correspond. It should be way long and just a little bit of height. And they took that puppy and they squished it up. And so it makes, it exaggerates the height of the thing. And so you, you, that, that looks scary. If that graph was this long and it was only this high, that wouldn't be as scary, would it? And, and so that's another thing that you have to watch out for. Okay, so Ice Age didn't happen. That'll be next year. Sea level rise. And this is another one that you can go and look at, and there is sea, sea level rise. If you, have, if you have warming over a period of time, obviously all that ice that was in Glacier Bay went into the ocean. And so you're going to have some sea level rise. And so is, is sea level, are sea levels rising at a rate that is going, you know, is going to swamp all the, you know, the coastal areas and, and that kind of stuff? And this is you know, sea level information um, from, bat from the Battery, New York. Okay, and so this is one of those areas where we have historical data that goes way back. And so back in 1850, um, and again, this is what we're what we're talking about is this is 0.3 meters. Okay, it's three tenths of a meter, right there. And so you're only talking about four tenths of a meter. You're you're talking about right around 18 inches, um, maybe not even that. Okay. Back in 1850, sea level rise was about 2.84 millimeters per year. 2.84 millimeters is, le is, is just over a tenth of an inch. So you're taking an inch, divide it into tenths. It's just over a tenth of an inch. When Teddy Roosevelt um, came along, uh, sea level rise was 2.84 millimeters per year on average. When Franklin Roosevelt comes along, it's 2.84 millimeters per year. When Jimmy Carter comes along, 2.84 millimeters per year. Barack Obama, 2.84 millimeters per year. And so you have a trend line, and you can see that trend line, and it just, it just goes straight up. And so there is sea level rise going on, but um, if the global warming issue was what we were looking at, and all this um, uh, heating has been taking place, especially since 1920, what you should see is a trend line that goes like this, and then takes off. 
goes up like this. And it doesn't. It's just a straight line scale. And so it is, it is getting warmer. Here's eustatic um, sea level. And this is sea level for the whole planet, basically. And again, you see the same kind of trend line. It is going up, but, it, but it's going up at a steady rate. You don't see this radical climb uh, from the industrialized age, and especially um, from 1920 on when more CO2 has been pumped into the atmosphere. Okay, and so there's some problems with that. Um, extreme weather, this is another one of those things. Hurricanes are getting more radical. Her, um, uh, uh, um, tornadoes are getting more radical. Storms are getting more radical. And every time we have a big storm, people go, it's global warming, once again. And again, they're confusing um, climate and weather. Um, so here's the hurricane power dissipation in index from 1970 to 2010. And actually, this comes from 1980. That's where they're starting their graph mark to 2010. And so, yeah, is there a rise in, in the intensity of hurricanes? Yes, there is. And you can see that from, from that graph. Here's the whole graph. And again, that's the problem. And so, you know, here, here's my deal with this stuff. If, if it's real, it's real. And, and, if it, and if it can be quantized, it can be quantized. And I like that stuff. It, when, I, when, I, when I look at the first graph, when I look at this one right here, and I see that, that causes me concern. When I found, find out that it comes from this one, that ticks me off. And that's the problem with this whole debate. Every time I run into something and something that causes me some kind of concern, I run into more information and it just ticks me off because somebody's got an agenda here and they're not giving me all the information. So again, when you're talking about the power dissipation index and you're talking about the power of hurricanes, actually hurricanes back during the 1930s are certain clear up here and this is a downward trend. If I take my line going from here to 2000 and what is that, 2004, that trend line goes down. Right, And if I take these two trend lines, or these, these two starting points, and I take a trend line from these two starting points, it goes down to even more because it starts right about there and it's going to go down to here. See what I mean? And so, when, uh, again, when you're looking at this information, this, this trend line is going to be, it's going to be up, then it's going to go down, then it's going to spike up a little bit, going to go down, go, going to go way up, going to go way down, going to go way up, down, and it, that's what it's going to look like. But as, as far as the whole graph, it's not showing what they're saying that it's showing. Okay? So this is the next one. This, this is really irritating because this is NASA. And I like NASA. And they're bumming me out. Okay, so this is, this is global temperatures as of 2005. Okay? And so global temperatures, they're, they're saying that there's been 7.7 uh, .7 degrees of warming since about 1880, okay? Which is, that's, that's the number, about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 degrees of warming over the last century um, is, is what you have. So here we're starting in 1880, and I want you to notice the starting point. It's at about negative 0.1, okay? And the ending point is up here around 6. Okay, so then we have another graph that came out in 2015. Now it's gone up a little bit. It's about to it's, it's about to 0.7, right? And we're talking about a degree, 0.7 of a degree, okay? But the starting point has gone down to negative three. See that? Negative one, negative three. How did the past change? <laughs> What's going on? And then you get to the next, the, the next one. This is in the same year. This is a January of 2015. And so now you got 1.1 degrees of warming. And then you go to January of 2015. And now we're down to negative 5, negative 0.5. And we're up around ne uh, uh, 0.7 or so. And now we've got 1.2 degrees of warming. And where, where the extra warming is coming from is the past. How is that happening? And again, you know, this, I, I look at a graph like this and I'm like, okay, well, that's, you know, that can be concerning. You know, you can, you can see this, this trend line and it, and it, and it does this whole thing where, you know, it, it kind of goes up here and then it flattens out during the sixties and, and starts going up some more and, and, and that kind of thing. And I, I can see that and that might, that might be concerning until I find out that they're, they're fudging the data back in the past. And now I don't know what's true. 
And that again is the problem with this stuff. Okay? Um, and just to give you some perspective, um, what, what Hansen, Hansen is uh, from uh, the NOAA. Um, he's uh, Dr. Hansen, he's a, he's a famous climatologist. And what he has said is the safe upper limit is about uh, 350 parts per million. That's what he would like everything to be down to, 350 to 380 parts per million. Uh, we had a pre-industrial level of CO2 that was 280 parts per million. And so he's thinking that you add about 100 parts per million to that and you're, you're probably okay. We're at, a, we're at a little over 400 right now, parts per million. The level that was reached during the ice ages is right down here. And um, below that, that's when plant, plant growth shuts down. In, fa uh, in fact, um, what scientists believe is that during the ice ages, um, life on Earth almost died off, was in danger of dying off because there wasn't enough CO2 to feed the plants. Okay, so this is what we're talking about right here, 400. And this is where it was 150 million years, years ago. I sh already showed you this on another graph. It was at 2,000. This is where it was 400 million years ago. And this is where it was 500 million years ago, according to their information. And so uh, did life die off? Did the planet burn up 500 million years ago? No, did it 400 million, 150 million years ago. And so again, you have that. Here's, a, here's another one. And this again is with a long age type thing, but this is, this is climate change over the last half billion years. And so what we have is, is these um, uh, radical temperatures um, up here, um, which again, you're, you're talking about, uh, this is zero, this is 10 right here, degrees centigrade. And so you have these higher temperatures up here that are going on, going on all the way up into the dinosaur ages, and then it starts taking a dive, and this right down here is the ice ages, and this is where we are in modern times. And here we are right here. See that? That doesn't concern me all that much. Okay? And so uh, again, and, I'm, and again, I'm using their stuff, and being, being a creationist, this concerns me quite a bit more than, than it would if I was an evolutionist, as far as the fluctuations and stuff goes. Uh, but again, when you're, when you're talking about their data, this is their data. And, and so there, there's something going on with the whole climate change debate that doesn't have to do with the data. Okay, here's another thing. Global warming email scandal shows scientists may have cooked the facts and uh, this is from 2009 U.S. New News and World Report. This is ClimateGate. And what happened was uh, a bunch of emails were hacked out of uh, a uh, climate um, lab uh, basically over in England. And it was emails between American climate scientists and British climate scientists. You know, mainly it was between those two groups. And some of those emails... Uh, were pretty pejorative in the in the sense that they were saying things about guys that didn't agree with them that was not good. Specifically, they were keeping them from publishing papers that contradicted their data. And um, afterwards, just just for full disclosure, um, these guys, these climate climate scientists, uh, their universities and uh, some other groups went through and they investigated them and cleared them of all wrongdoing. Okay. But I went through and read some of the emails. And they may have cleared them all wrongdoing, but these guys were actually trying to keep papers uh, from being published. And I've got some emails that, that show that. And so I don't know who was doing the investigating, but they gave them a, gave them a clean bill of health when they were, they were doing some nasty stuff. And this is one of the things that, that can happen when you're, you're dealing with money, frankly. Because these guys are making a lot of money off of governments that are worried about climate change. And, and so you have this. Uh, preliminary analysis of the contents of thousands of emails and documents taken from the computer archives of the Climate Research Unit at England's University of East Anglia, possibly by a hacker, possibly by a whistleblower. It was by a hacker. Indicate a number of the world's most important scientists engaged in research designed to prove that global warming really does exist 
uh, may have been cooking the books. As columnist Michael Barone wrote in Sunday's Washington Examiner, the CRU has been a major source of data on global temperatures relied on by the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, but the email suggests that CRU scientists have been suppressing and misstating data and working to prevent the publication of conflicting views in peer-reviewed science periodicals. And that last line is absolutely true. It's what they did. And, and so... That's not good. That's not good. It's not good science. It's not the way that life is supposed to go. Um, science is supposed to be science. And, you know, these people are people, and obviously they're not believers, and there's integrity issues and that kind of stuff that goes along with this. But I can't stand corruption in these kinds of areas because I really like to know the data. I really like to know the facts on the whole thing. And if the facts pointed to we're all going to burn up, that's a good thing to know. No global warming for 18 years and eight months. And that's been, that's been the case. This is, this is back in 1998. We had one of the hottest years on record. And then this is what's been happening ever since that point. And again, goes down, goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down, but you have a trend line and that trend line is flat. Okay. So this right here is weather. 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 That's a trend line. Okay, that's, that's, that's what you're looking at. Okay, so warming oceans. And this, is a, this is the latest one. This one really ticked me off. NOAA fiddles with climate data to erase the 15-year glo global warming hiatus. That was three years ago. And so to increase the rate in warming, NOAA scientists put more weight on certain ocean buoy arrays. That means they, they cherry-picked the data, and the ones that were reading hotter is the ones that they gave more relevance to, okay? Adjusted ship-based temperature readings upward and slightly raised land-based temperatures as well. Scientists said adjusted ship-based temperature data had the largest impact on trends for the 2014 time period, accounting for uh, 0.030C of the 0.064C trend difference. And here's the, here again is the problem with this. Um, you, you know what? You don't take temperatures from ships. What they were doing was taking temperatures from the intakes of a ship. So ships intake water to cool engines and, and, and do that kind of stuff. A ship is what's called a heat sink. It's hotter than the ocean. And so you have water running through something that's hotter than the ocean. You're not going to get a, a, a valid measurement on this stuff. They have buoys that are set up, that are set up in certain places at certain depths. They stay there all the time. That's where you're supposed to be getting your information. And I don't understand why they're getting it from ships in the first place. And, you know, then they did some stuff with going back and, again, fiddling with the, with the past data and adjusting the past data downward while they adjust the, the present data upward. And I don't like that. So... You know, if it, if it goes the other way, you know, there should, should, you know, if you got to fiddle with data, it should be going both directions. It shouldn't just be going one direction because what that indicates is an agenda. And so, again, you have to watch out for that. This is a climate scientist, Dr. Richard Lindzen, marks the 97% consensus, and he says it is propaganda. And what this is talking about is 97% of climate scientists or 97% of scientists agree that anthropogenic global warming is something that is a fact. Okay, I'm going to tell you right now, I would be included in that if I were a scientist because I think the earth has warmed up. And, and that's where you get the 97% consensus. This is what Lindsay said. He says, they never really tell you what they agree on. It's propaganda. So all scientists agree it's probably warmer now than it was at the end of the Little Ice Age. I agree with that. Almost all scientists agree that if you add CO2, you will have some warming. I agree with that. Um, maybe very little warming. That's a good possibility. I don't know yet. Um, but it is propaganda to translate that into it's, it is dangerous and we must reduce CO2, etc. If you can make an ambiguous remark and you have people who will amplify it, um, and they, he's quoting them, they said it, not me, and the response of the political system is to increase your funding, what's not to like? And so I'm a scientist and, you know, and, and everybody's going off on global warming and, and I'm doing something in the area of meteorology and they're going to throw money at me? Okay. <laughs> you know? yeah, what are, is it warmer? Yes, it's warmer. Does CO2 cause warming? Yes. Yes, it does. And I could do that in, in all good conscience. 
Just as I sit right here. I just don't know how much warming is being caused by man-made um, situations. Here's another thing. This just came out a few years ago. Mars. That's the planet Mars. Washington Times. Earth isn't the only planet grappling with climate change. Although this other orb doesn't have much in the way of fossil fuel emissions or a 97% of scientific consensus on global warming, newly published evidence suggests Mars is experiencing global warming as it emerges from an ice age. The research was conducted using an instrument on board the NASA Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter that allowed an unprecedented examination of the most recent Martian ice age recorded in the planet's north polar ice cap, according to a NASA press release. Research was led by planetary scientist Isaac B. Smith, Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado. It said, we found an accelerated accumulation rate of ice in the uppermost 100 to 300 meters of the polar ice cap. The volume and thickness of ice matches model predictions from the early 2000s. Radar observations of the ice cap provide a detailed history of ice accumulation and erosion associated with climate change. Speculation about climate change on Mars has heightened since 2001. Photographs from the Mars Global Surveyor suggested that ice caps near the, uh, the planet's South Pole were, were receding. A 2007 uh, study by Russian physicist uh, Habibulo Abdusamatov, wow, that's a name, concluded that the caps had been in decline for three summers in a row and attributed the decline to solar irradiance. And this, this is something that came out in the mid-2000s and it was poo-pooed. We don't, we don't know if, if the polar ice caps are really retreating because we don't have enough evidence. And then here we are um, later on in the mid-2010s, uh, you know, and we've got the exact same kind of evidence that's going on. And so Mars is having climate change. It's warming up, okay? And so they admit that now, but they say that's just coincidental, okay? And uh, one of the things that... I think is um, uh, you know like a non sequitur. I don't I don't I don't know how how scientists go there. Is that the sun doesn't have any effect on global warming? So whatever. <laughs> global warming. I'll give you global warming. <laughs> if you got a, if you got a Bible, go go to Revelation chapter eight. We'll check this out. I didn't put any cool pictures in, but I got some information. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth, and there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. Then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened, a third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. And I looked, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because of the remaining blasts of the trumpets, uh, of the trumpet of the three angels who were about to sound. Now when you go through that passage, um, what that looks like is an asteroid strike. That's what it looks like to me, okay? And so that's what I think it is. Um, it's, a, it's a mountain burning with fire. You had something the size of a mountain going down through the Earth's atmosphere. It would, it would burn with fire. That's what would happen as it came in. And there are things that happen when that kind of stuff goes on. And we even have programs. There's a, there's a program on the Internet um, where you can look at the effects of an asteroid impact. And it's one of those things I mess around with. I change sizes, change locations, and, and that kind of stuff. And I'm, I'm going to give you some of this. Actually, this is, this is from uh, uh, an article by a guy named Sidney Vandenberg called Life and Death in the Inner Solar System. Um, and it's from May 1989. He considers 
um, a, a you know, let me put this up for you. He considers a typical um, impact scenario of a 10 kilometer object. It's about uh, five eighths of a mile, um, uh, or excuse me, um, 6.25 miles. Sorry about that. Um, uh, object with density 2.5 times that of water impacting at a speed of 20 kilometers per second. Its mass is 1.3 trillion tons. And then he, um, he also does one uh, for a kilometer uh, object, which is about five-eighths of a mile, and one that has um, 1.31 billion tons, okay? And so there's an explosion that takes place. Largest yield of a thermonuclear warhead is around 50 to 100 megatons. The kinetic energy of the falling object is converted to the explosion when it hits. Um, the 10 kilometer object produces an explosion of six times 107 megatons of TNT. Um, oh no, excuse me, six times 10 to the seventh. Sorry about that. That's what that's supposed to be. 10 to the seventh. That's 10, that's, that's a one with seven zeros behind it. Okay. Megatons of TNT equivalent to an earthquake of magnitude 12.4 on the Richter scale. On its way to the impact, the asteroid pushes aside the air in front of it, creating a hole in the atmosphere. The atmosphere above the impact site is removed for several tens of seconds. Before the surrounding air can rush back in to fill the gap, material from the impact, vaporized asteroid, crustal material, ocean water, if it lands in the ocean, escapes through the hole, follows a ballistic flight path back down, Within two minutes after the impact, about 105 cubic kilometers of ejecta um, is lofted to about 100 kilometers. If the asteroid hits the ocean, the surrounding water returning over the hot crater floor is vaporized. A large enough impact will break through to the hot lithosphere, that's the crust of the Earth, and maybe the even hot, hotter asthenosphere, sending more water vapor into the air as well as causing huge steam explosions that greatly compound the effect of the initial impact explosion. There'll be a crater regardless of where it lands. The di that means if you're in the middle of the ocean and it's five, mil five miles deep, there's still a crater, is what they're talking about. There will be a crater regardless of where it lands. The diameter of the crater in kilometers is equal to 0.765 times the energy of the impact in megatons um, and so on and so forth. There's gonna be a tsunami that comes from that a giant wave. And so a 10 kilometer asteroid hitting any deep point in the Pacific produces a mega tsunami along the entire Pacific Rim. And so here's some numbers. I converted them from uh, kilometers and, and uh, um, meters um, into feet and miles. And so if it's 186 miles, if it's a 10 kilometer asteroid, which again is about six miles across, a little over six miles across, if, it, if it's 186 miles away from you, the wave is going to be 4,265 feet tall. If it's 620 miles away from you, it's going to be 1,772 feet tall. If it's 1,864 miles away from you, it's going to be 820 feet tall. <laughs> and if it's 6,000 miles away from you, it's going to be 328 feet tall when it hits the coast. That will reach us. We're only at 400 feet, right? Go, it'll go all the way up the, the, the Columbia River Gorge. That's what we're talking about. And if we're talking about something this big, that's exactly what's going to happen. And so the Bible says when this thing strikes the water, that a third of the ships are destroyed. Okay. <laughs> I can see why, right? And so basically what happens is it comes in, it's coming in so fast and so hot that it's making a hole in the atmosphere behind it. When it hits the ground, what it does is it throws all that material back through the hole in the atmosphere. It goes up into space. All that material goes up into space and then it comes raining down around the, the rest of the globe. And when it talks about ballistic trajectory, it means it doesn't go into orbit. It just, you know, takes a big arc and goes out, okay? And so this is some of the effects of that. The material ejected from the impact through the hole in the atmosphere will re-enter all over the globe and heat up from the friction with the atmosphere. The chunks of material will be hot enough to produce a lot of infrared light. The heat from the glowing material will start fires around the globe, like uh, all the green grass and a third of the trees burned up. Um, the heat from, uh, or the global fires will uh, put about seven times 10 to the 10th tons of soot into the air this would aggravate environmental stresses associated with the impact, you think? The heat from the shock wave of the entering atmosphere 
Um, and reprocessing of the air close to the impact produces nitric and nit nitrous acids over the next few months to one year. And what this is talking about is most of our um, ap atmosphere is made out of nitrogen. And so there is a chemical reaction that takes place from, from the heat, you know, go, the heat that um, is generated by this. And so you get nitrous acids. These are some of the most radical acids that you've got. Um, I've actually, I got that. These are really nasty acids. <laughs> They'll wash out of the air when it rains, a worldwide deluge of acid rain, again, with damaging effects. And so in this passage, it talks about the fresh waters being turned bitter. Right? And so you, you have that whole thing. Um, you're going to have destruction or damage of foliage. You're going to have great amounts of weathering of continental rocks. The upper ocean organ organisms are killed. These organisms are responsible for locking up carbon dioxide in their shells that would eventually become limestone. However, the shells will dissolve in the acid water. That, along with the impact winter, kills off about 90% of all marine nanoplankton species. A majority of the free oxygen from photosynthesis on the Earth is made from nanoplankton. The ozone layer is destroyed by O3 reacting with uh, nitrous oxide. The amount of uh, ultraviolet light Hitting the surface increases, killing small organisms and plants. Remember the, the first passages I read out of Revelation chapter 16? It talks about the sun burning people. You have something like this happen and the ozone layer goes away. The ozone layer is what protects us from ultraviolet light and that's exactly what's going to take place. The sun's going to be burning people. The ozone layer is just, uh, or uh, killing small organisms. Uh, the NO2 um, uh, causes respiratory damage in larger animals. All of the dust in the air from the impact and soot from the fires will block the sun. So you have darkness. For several months, you cannot see your hand in front of your face, just like it says in Revelation 16. The dramatic decrease of sunlight reaching the surface produces a drastic short-term global reduction in, in temperature called impact winter. Plant pho photosynthesis stops and the food chain collapses. The cooling is followed by a much more prolonged period of increased temperature due to a large increase in the greenhouse effect put a bunch of stuff in the atmosphere, holds in heat. The greenhouse effect is increased because of the increase of the carbon dioxide and water vapor in the air. The carbon dioxide level rises because the plants are burned and most of the plankton are wiped out. Also, water vapor in the air from the impact stays aloft for a while. The temperatures are too warm for comfort for a while. And then, um, again, we have these passages. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea and it became blood. Nitric acids contain substantial quantities of dissolved nitrogen, di uh, nitrogen dioxide, and when they do, they leave the solution with a reddish-brown color. And so that may be what is being spoken about there. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. And so you have that. Okay. This is another subject that I wanted to talk, to, talk about. Isn't that kind of creepy? Yeah. And so I believe in global warming. <laughs> and I believe in climate change. I just don't know if we're having it yet. Okay. There is some climate change. I just don't, I just don't know how much of that is agenda driven. And I don't know, you know, uh, and again, it's because there's fiddling with the data. Oh, here's a, here's another thing I wanted to tell you about this. Um, CO2 has an impact on the atmosphere, but it's logarithmic. Okay. And so do you guys remember log logarithms? So when you charted a logarithm, it basically, you know, let me, let me do this on the screen. A logarithm, uh, say this is the, this is the x axis. This is the y-axis, sorry, I'm saying that to you. Um, but a logarithmic function, like an L, a log two function, will do this. It'll go up steeply and then it'll start flattening out and it'll go like that. That's what a logarithmic function does. And so what we're talking about right now is that they're worried about CO2 levels doubling from 280 to, to 560. Okay, and so we're already right around 400. And because CO2 has, uh, the greenhouse effect of CO2 is logarithmic, 70% of the heating from a doubling of CO2 has already taken place. That's the way that works. 70% has already taken place. So we've had a 38% rise 
that means 70% of the heating has already been done. Okay, and so the heating, you know, uh, uh, parts per million times heating just goes down as you keep going. That's not ex an excuse to keep, you know, throwing CO2 in the atmosphere, but, you know, it's, it's not a straight line thing. And so you have to know that too, okay? Here's a, this is a, another subject that I wanted to talk about, and this has to do with, with some of the stuff that we've got going on culturally. Um, and this is, this is something that um, I kind of worry about because the United States isn't really mentioned in prophecy. You got some places that, that you can look at that um, may be indications that the United States is there, but I've been, I've been looking for things uh, for decades that gets the United States out of the picture as far as prophecy goes. And this is what I mean by this. In, in the book of Ezekiel, um, book of Ezekiel talks about Russia. The book of Ezekiel talks about Iran. The book of Ezekiel talks about Turkey. They talk about Libya. They talk about Ethiopia. They talk about Egypt. They talk about Israel. They talk about Europe. They talk, you know, they talk about all these nations. They don't talk about us. So what's going on? And why isn't the United States mentioned? Because we are the superpower. And so one of the things that, that I've been looking at um, uh, for a long time is what gets the United States out of the way. That could be political um, in, in the sense of uh, uh, the, the politics of the United States becomes more and more isolationist. That's one possibility. It could be military. It could be a number of different things. It could be economic. That's, those are things that I've been looking at lately because we've got a $20, billion or $20 trillion debt right now, and that doesn't even count because it's well over $270 trillion when you talk about what we really owe. So that nice $20 trillion number is the nice number. The real number is $270 trillion. You're never paying it back. And your children are never paying it back. So politicians have got us in, into a really bad position financially. And the only reason that we're still around economically is because our currency is basically the currency of the world and our, our economy is the strongest one in the world. And as soon as either one of those things stops happening, then we're done economically. And so um, you, you can't continue this stuff. So there are, there are different options for the, the United States being out of the picture. And so one of them is maybe we're missing because we get defeated in warfare. Okay, And so that's been a worry of mine off and on. Uh, back during the 70s, uh, when Ronald Reagan uh, was coming into power, uh, the previous presidents had allowed the military of the United States to deteriorate, deteriorate after uh, Vietnam, and it got to be a pretty scary thing because the whole time that we were uh, putting all our uh, uh, hardware into mothballs and um, lowering our military uh, might, basically, the Russians, the Soviet Union, was cranking it up. Reagan gets into power, and he, and he decides he's going to crank it up. And that became a scare, scary point in time for me specifically because I'm reading stuff where people are, are talking about this stuff from a, a Soviet perspective, and it's the kind of thing where if they don't take the advantage at that point, they're going to lose the advantage because we're an economic powerhouse. We want to crank up our military. We can beat them. But if they've already got the military weaponry and they want to take us out, the early 80s was the time to do it. And so it was pretty scary. There was some scary stuff going on. People were building bomb shelters, man. And uh, you think they were doing it in the 50s. I knew a guy that, you know, I, I knew some crazy people. <laughs> But he, he took and, and he, he, you know, he had a tunnel that that thing, Bobby, did you go in that tunnel with me? Yeah, this guy had a tunnel that had to be 400 feet long. Going down, you know, down from the bottom of his house out, out the side of a cliff and he put, and he, you know, he built like a bomb shelter thing and a backhoe and dumped a bunch of dirt on the top of it and he was showing it to me and telling me I could come out there if everything fell apart. And I was like, Okay, so maybe we get defeated in warfare. And I don't know that that's an issue now because um, even though there, there's problems with the Soviet Union, they're nowhere near parity with the United States. Uh, China is a little bit more wor worrisome. Iran and uh, North Korea, I know, that, I know that we worry about those things. 
and there's some worrisome uh, things that the North Koreans can do. You know, this whole thing with the uh, with the Olympics over in Seoul. <laughs> you know, you got some dude with <laughs> ICBMs, and and he's crazy in the first place. You know, he could he could cause some real damage. He could cause some real damage just by cannon fire. Seoul's almost up on the border. And so um, there, there's some real issues there, and, and I'm not minimizing those things, but North Korea has not taken out the United States, and neither is Iran, and right now neither is Russia, not at this point. And so, you know, they still got nukes and stuff like that, but um, the, there's, there's not really much of a chance that they're going to do that. And so as far as the, the military thing, unless there's some super-duper secret attack that takes place where, where they somehow wipe out everything... I don't think I have to worry about that. And so um, I have a quote here from Mad Dog Mattis. He's a local hero. <laughs> Mad, uh, Mad Dog Mattis <laughs> asked about his concerns for 2018. He respond, responds with just seven powerful wor words. During a rare press gaggle at the Pentagon Friday afternoon, a reporter from Voice of America asked Mattis what concerns he has for 2018. Mattis responded with just seven powerful words, I don't have concerns, I create them. <laughs> just last month, Mattis was asked if he carries challenge coins with him, which are unit-specific coins that military unit leaders hand out to troops as tokens of appreciation or achievement. Mattis told the reporter no and offered this five-word response, I'm saving money for bombs. <laughs> I like that guy. <laughs> I didn't know him before President Trump put him in. I, I just like that. I think that's pretty cool. Um, so maybe we're missing because of economic decline and lack of influence. So that's a possibility, and it's still a possibility. But um, we have some stuff that, that's going on that, that looks like it's turning, around, turning things around economically, and I don't know if that's going to be something that lasts or not. But um, this is an indicator. America's small businesses haven't been this pumped up since the roaring Reagan economy. Uh, the NFIB's measure of small business optimism reached its highest level in 34 years in November. Handful of more specific indexes also climbed to record or near record levels. We haven't seen this kind of optimism in 34 years and we've seen it only once in the 44 years that NFIB has been conducting this research. Small business owners are exuberant about the economy and they're ready to lead the US uh, economy in a period of robust growth. And so it's looking like the economy is turning around. And, um, uh, you know, again, again, you have that whole thing. And so that, that may put off any economic decline for a period of time, and that would be a good thing. Hopefully they'll do something with the deficits and all that kind of stuff. Um, maybe we're missing out of the prophetic picture because of civil collapse caused by internal strife. And that's what I'm worried about now, because that's what I'm seeing. Um, so I wanted to talk to you guys about decline of culture. Um, political and economic and social problems our nation encounters are the symptom of the spiritual decline of a nation. And some of this is taken from, uh, from an article uh, that I picked up. But, and I've got his name in here somewhere, but I, I, I can't remember what his name was. It's Anderson. Um, just as there are spiritual principles, and that's who I'm quoting Anderson here, that influence the life of an individual, so there are political spiritual principles that govern the life of a nation. And though we may feel that these are obscure and difficult to discern, in reality they are visible to anyone willing to look at the record of history. Our problem is that we don't really learn from history. George Santayana uh, said that those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it. The philosopher Hegel said, what experience and history teach us is this, that people and government never have learned anything from history or acted on principles deduced from it. Or as Winston Churchill said, the one thing we've learned from history is that we don't learn from history. <laughs> history has shown that the average age of the great civilizations is around 200 years. Countries like Great Britain exceed the average, while other countries like the United, United States are just now reaching the average age. And then he has this list of 10 stages that a culture moves through. The first stage moves from bondage to spiritual faith. The second stage, from spiritual faith to great courage. Third, moves from great courage to liberty. Fourth is from liberty to abundance. The fifth, it moves from abundance to selfishness. The sixth stage moves from selfishness to complacency. The seventh stage moves from complacency to apathy. 
The eighth stage moves from apathy to moral decay. The ninth stage moves from moral decay to dependence. And the tenth and last stage moves from dependence to bondage. You can see that in Greece. You can see that in Rome. You can see that in France. There's any number of nations, number of cultures that you can go through and they move through this. So where are we? Yeah. Um, ninth stage. Moral decay to dependence. We were right in here. And so that, again, is a scary thing. Let me, let me read a, a passage to you. And you guys are, um, a lot of you are familiar with this because um, I, I, there, there's some passages that I kind of quote from routinely. And this is one of them. Find it here. Know this, then the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That has all changed within my lifespan because it didn't used to be like that. When I was a kid, most of this wasn't true about the people that I was around. And I came from a messed up family. And it wasn't true about the people that I was around. Um, there's an, another passage that talks about the, the fact that people are going to turn away from the truth. Um, he says, for the time will come, this is in uh, chapter three and verse three, or chapter four and verse three, it says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And so we have, the, the Bible specifically talks about the decline of culture in the last days. And so decline of the family, let's talk about this. Um, British historian J.D. Unwin and Russian sociologist uh, Patiram Sorokin who has studied civilizations that have collapsed have seen this pattern repeated continually. In his book, Our Dance Has Turned to Death, Carl Wilson identifies the common pattern of family decline in ancient Greece and the Roman Empire. In the first stage, men ceased to lead their families in worship. Spiritual and moral development became secondary. Um, their view of God became naturalistic, mathematical, and mechanical. In the second stage, men selfishly neglected care of their wives and children to pursue material wealth, political and military power, and cultural development. Material values began to dominate thought, and the man began to exalt his own role as an individual. In the third stage um, involved a change in man's sexual values. Men who were preoccupied with business or war either neglected their wives sexually or became involved with lower class women or with homosexuality. Ultimately, a double standard of morality developed. And this is famously, we know about this from uh, biblical history. Guys would have wives and then they would, then they would have mistresses in Greece. And so the mistress was for fun and the wife was for children. And so you had that, that whole thing going on. Fourth stage affected women, the role of women at home and with children lost value and status. Women were neglected and their roles devalued. Soon they revolted to gain access to material wealth and also freedom for sex outside marriage. Women also began to minimize having sex relations to conceive children and the emphasis became sex for pleasure. Marriage laws were changed to make divorce easy. Again, this happened in Greece and it happened in Rome. Has it happened here? Oh yeah, yeah. Isn't that interesting? It's just, it's just really wild how over thousands of years, nobody changes. It's exactly the, same, the, exactly the same process, exactly the same situations. In the fifth stage, husbands and wives competed against each other for money, home leadership, and the affection of their children. This resulted in hostility and frustration and possible homosexuality in their children. Many marriages ended in separation and divorce. Many children were unwanted, aborted, abandoned, molested, and undisciplined. Uh, the more undisciplined children became, the more social pressure there was not to have children. The breakdown of the home produced anarchy. In the sixth stage, selfish individualism grew and carried over into society, fragmenting it into smaller and smaller group loyalties. 
The nation was thus weakened by internal conflict. The decrease in the birth rate produced an older population that had less ability to defend itself and less will to do so, making the nation more vulnerable to its enemies. That right there is one of the things that I've been noticing in uh, modern Western societies, that the birth rates are going down. And it all has to do with this, with this whole thing um, uh, where there's an abandonment of the family. And it, um, I, didn't, I didn't know until um, I got into some of this, this stuff later on when I was a Christian and went back and actually looked at uh, some, of the, some of the things that you have with the Roman Empire. I have some books, uh, Gibbon on the decline and the fall of the Roman Empire, and he talks about some of this stuff that was going on in Rome and it's stuff that's happening today. Finally, unbelief in God became more complete, parental authority diminished, and ethical and moral principles disappeared, affecting the economy and government. Thus, by internal weakness and fragmentation, the societies came apart. There was no way to save them except by a dictator who arose from within or by variants who um, invaded from without. One unforgettable law has been learned through all the disasters and injustices of the last thousand years. If things go well for the family, life is worth living. When the family falters, life falls apart. Family is, is the smallest unit of civilization. That's the way that goes. I was watching, um, somebody put this on my Facebook page not too long ago, and it was, a, you know, kind of an illustration of um, privilege, and specifically white privilege. And so what these guys did was um, they took a bunch of people, and it was racially mixed. They took a bunch of people, lined them up on a line, and said, you're going to race, and you're going to race to get a $100 bill, Okay. And um, the guy was standing, you know, like 50 yards off, and, he, and he's talking to these guys. And he said, but before we race, what we're going to do is we're going to um, give some of you guys, you know, kind of a head start. And so um, he started going through a list of uh, provisos, basically. And he said, the first one was, if you had uh, two parents in the home, take one step forward. And then he said, if you had a father or a male figure in the home, take another step forward. Um, if you didn't have to worry about paying the electric bill or the phone bill or any, any one of the bills, you never had to worry about that stuff, take another step forward. You can see where this is going, right? Um, uh, if, uh, you, um, if you went to college and you didn't have to pay for it and you did not get an athletic scholarship, take another step forward. And so... Now you're looking at this group of people and most of the people who are standing back on the, you know, a, a lot of these guys are standing back on the starting line, line and guess what color they are? Most of them are black. There's a few, there's a few Latinos and, and some whites in there, but most of them are black and they're, they're standing on the line. And he goes through this whole list of, of societal uh, situations that, um, um, you know, if your college was paid for, uh, if... Uh, your parents were able to get you a tutor if, uh, if you were able to go to a private school, all of, those, all of those things. And so these kids have a huge head start, and then the guy t has them turn around and look at the other kids and go, that's what privilege is, okay? And, you know, let me just say this. I, I, I came from a, uh, a background where... Um, I was a welfare kid, and not all the time, not the whole time that I was growing up, but for a major portion of it, I was a welfare kid. And I'm saying that from, from this point of view. None of that is privilege. All of that is normal. That's how life is supposed to go for everyone. You're supposed to have two parents in the household. You're supposed to have a dad. They're, they're, spo they're supposed to take care of the bills. You're not supposed to have to worry about paying the bills. And so I'm going through and I'm looking at that. And, I, and, and as soon as the guy did it, you know, um, I, I'm like, okay, I know where this is going. And you know where I would have been? One step forward. I, you know, and, and that's kind of an iffy thing because I did have a father figure in the home for a certain period of time. And then the rest of the time, it was just guys who were lining up and coming through and, and leaving. And so I would, have been, I would have been back there with the black guys. And this is my point. I would have been back there with the black guys, and everybody else would have been privileged, and you know where my son would have been? At the head. You know where my daughter would have been? At the head. 
You know how long that took? One generation. Just one. So I would have been back at the finish line. My kid's way on up ahead. And the reason that he's way on, on up ahead is because I've been married to my wife the whole time that they've been, you know, they've been growing up. And I've been working the whole time that they've been growing up. And I've been saving and, and doing things for them and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that. But, you, but, but do you see how quickly everything can change in our country? Like everything can change in one generation if everybody just does, you know, and, and, and that's not even something, I don't think all those kids that were out front came from Christian homes. That's just normal life. That's just like mom, dad, pay the bills, love their kids, take care of them, that kind of thing. And that's all, that's all it takes. And that's the basics of what the Bible has to say about how the family's supposed to go. And so when I, when I look at around at our cultural problems, um, you know, uh, uh, they, they were also, I think they also talked about um, situations with uh, uh, premarital pregnancy and, and all that kind of stuff. When we look at all the problems that we've got and all the, all the junk that it does in the family unit, all of that can, can be changed in literally one generation. In, 20, in less than 20 years, it can all turn around. If, and, and that's why the Bible is so cool. That's why God is so cool. Because he can take a total mess and flip that puppy right on its head. And all of a sudden, everybody's privileged again. And so, you know, when, when, um, when I was watching that, that whole thing, um, you know, I can, I can be the guy, you know, I can, uh, um, I can be the guy that's sitting on the, on the starting line. And I'm a white guy with blue eyes. And so I know I've got some different things going on than, than some of the guys I grew up with who were, who were my friends who, um, who had black skin. But um, I could sit there and I could look at my life and go, woe is me, I'm back on the starting line and everybody has you know, a, a 20 yard advantage on me. Um, what it actually did was made me mad because he's capping on my kid. Because my kid would have been out front. He would have turned my kid around and said, you should feel bad because you've got an advantage on these other guys. No, he shouldn't. He should feel good because he had a family and he grew up in it. And that's where everybody should be. So again, when you're, when you're talking about um, family, it's, it's a huge thing. And um, it's why God puts such emphasis on it because it, it can turn a person's life around. It's a real cool thing. From God to idolatry. Second stage, or actually, this is out of the book of Romans. Um, I want to read this to you. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not getting through everything. <laughs> I'm going to start at 8.30, and you know what? Um, I'll probably just uh, do the rest of this next week. Um, you know, if you guys want to come back. If you don't want to come back, we're going to, we're going to put it on the... Uh, on uh, the web page at some point. But in Romans chapter 1, um, starting in verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth for, of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. That's talking about the, the penalty is talking about disease there. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, 
being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. And that is Paul's um, judgment on a nation or a culture that has rejected God and suppressed the truth. And again, it's, it, it's a series of steps downward. And so in this passage, what happens is a culture goes from knowing the real God, knowing the true God, and going into idolatry. We all got off the same boat, according to the Bible. Is Noah's Ark. We all got off the same boat. And there's some interesting things in the Old Testament where people have a relationship with God. You heard of Melchizedek? Abraham runs into a guy named Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a real guy. And he knew the Lord. And he wasn't any part of Abraham's family. How'd that happen? Well, it's because his ancestors got off the same boat as Abraham's ancestors. And so you still had a knowledge of God. And what happened is over time, people turned away from that knowledge of God, began to suppress the truth, and began to go into idolatry. The second step that you see that passage is illicit sexual immorality. And, you know, when, when we're talking about idolatry, um, uh, you know, we look back on ancient times and we go, well, you know, they, they worship statues and, and that kind of stuff. And we think of that as being idolatry. Um, but what you actually have in this passage, it says, is that they knew God and they suppressed the truth about God. And even though his attributes were clearly seen, verse 20, um, they did not glorify him as God, verse 21, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. And what that's saying is they stopped worshiping God and they start, started worshiping, worshiping the creation. And we think they were so sophisticated. But um, back then, they're worshiping animals as gods and, you know, as, as the ones who, were, who brought them into existence and who ultimately were the, the purveyors of the, of the coming of the human race. We do exactly the same thing, only we make, we make it all scientific. And so came from a monkey who came from, you know, some other kind of mammal, who came from a reptile, who came from a fish or an amphibian, came from a fish, came from a multi-celled creature, and then finally came from goo. And... That's the creation. We, we think that, that matter plus time plus energy equals me. And that's worshiping the creation. We don't have any need of a creator anymore. And so you have that whole thing. Once you get rid of a creator, you don't have any reason to um, have a moral standard, except for one that's, you know, frankly arbitrary. Because if I'm just an animal... If all I am is, you know, an evolved monkey, if that's all I am, then what's all this stuff about being faithful to my wife? I mean, evolutionarily, evolutionarily um, maybe what I should be doing is spreading my genes all over the place, right? And so having sex with as many women as possible so that I can get my DNA around. And I have known people who use that as, as an excuse, I've, I've, I've known guys who over the years joked around with me about that kind of nonsense and said that kind of thing. And so they, they were animals when they started out and they're nothing but animals now. And so no problem acting like an animal, is there? And again, what you see is a, is a degradation of society. They leave the, 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 they leave the stuff that God calls them to and they go off into something that is immoral. And so illicit sexual immorality. And so we've had problems with that for decades now. And I'm talking about major problems. We have murder rates that, uh, you know, some of you guys are cops. When somebody gets murdered, what you usually do is you go to the person who's closest to them to see if that's the murderer. 
And if that's the murder, it's usually over sex. That's, that's usually what's going on. They either want to have sex with somebody else or they have had sex with somebody else and somebody's mad about it and so they shot somebody or poisoned them or stabbed them or whatever. And so, you know, you look at, you look at some of the most violent murders that, that there have been around. When you've got somebody who almost cuts off a guy's head, he's a little irritated. When you've got somebody who almost cuts off a woman's head, he's a little irritated. And it's almost always over, over infidelity in that situation. And so illicit sexual immorality. And then it goes from illicit sexual immorality into homosexuality. And so do we have, you know, it's like, it's like you look at these stages again, you have this collapse of, of a society and the stages that are mentioned in the Bible, and we see exactly the same stages. The sexual revolution started in the 60s, you guys. And so it goes from illicit sexual immorality, and then it goes into homosexuality. I didn't know a homosexual before 1980. I didn't know anyone. And I lived in Southern California. No one I knew was a homosexual. No, you know, it's like, didn't happen. And so now we got this. Americans' acceptance of sexual immorality is growing. Gallup finds. Um, when asked about the moral acceptability of a range of issues, five of the top six issues that saw an increase in acceptability were related to sexual morality. The largest increase in moral acceptability from 2001 to 2015 was for homosexual relations, which increased 23 percentage points from 40 to 63%. Now, 63% of people think that homosexual relations is okay. okay. That was followed by having a baby outside of marriage. So it used to be 45% back in 2005. Now it's 61%. Not a problem. Heterosexual sex outside of marriage went from 53% to 68%. Um, divorce from 59% to 71%, and polygamy from 7%, it's doubled, 7% to 16%. Who are these crazy people? Anyway, also in the top six for increase in moral acceptability was medical research using stem cells, um, uh, which increased from uh, 12 percentage points. Views on the moral acceptability of or abortion did not change. From 2001 to 2015, the percentage of those saying abortion is morally acceptable went from 42 to 45 percent, which was within the polls plus or minus four percentage points. Another recent poll found support for same-sex marriage at an all-time high for Gallup. Sixty percent said same-sex marriages should be legally recognized, while 37 percent were opposed. Sixty percent. August 2014 study found that Christians who support same-sex marriage are more likely to support other types of sexual immorality, such as premarital cohabitation, shacking up, no strings attached sex, abortion, and viewing pornography. The increased acceptance of sexual immorality also tracks with an increase in those identifying themselves as socially liberal. The percentage of those who say they are social liberals is now the same as those who say they are conservative on social issues, 31%, according to Gallup. Um, this liberalization of attitudes toward moral issues is part of a complex set of factors affecting the social and cultural fabric of the U.S. Regardless of the factors causing the shifts, the trend toward a more liberal view on moral behaviors will certainly have implications for such fundamental social institutions as marriage, the environment in which children are raised, and the economy. Frank Newport, editor-in-chief for Gallup wrote. And so it goes from, uh, from sexual immorality to homosexuality, and the fourth stage is anarchy. That's what you have in the Bible here. Fourth stage is anarchy. Once a society has rejected God's revelation, it's on its own. Moral and social anarchy is the natural result. Um, passage in Romans, again, says, since they, since they thought, thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They're backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. And they invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. Transgender agenda hits kindergarten, and I'm just talking about anarchy now. Transgender agenda hits uh, kindergarten. Some state laws are written to prevent parents even from opting their children out of the indoctrination. 
from California to Minnesota to the District of Columbia, the transgender agenda has infiltrated the classrooms of even the most tender youth. Last week, Alexander DeSanctis reported for National Review Online about the transition ceremony hosted by a kindergarten teacher at California's Rockland Academy Gateway to celebrate a gender dysphoric boy donning the attire and appellation of a little girl. As DeSanctis noted, the shocked and angry parents of the Rockland pupils had not received advance notice of the lesson and learned of the events only when their confused children returned home. This is what happened. As a kindergarten teacher, um, a little boy comes in, uh, actually may have been first grade. It was kindergarten or first grade. A um, uh, little boy, uh, ha, uh, the parents told him that um, he is transgender, and so she had a little conversation with her classroom, uh, talked about the whole issue of gender and how people can, you know, apparently pick their gender or whatever, however they feel. And so the little boy was dressed as a little boy, went out of the classroom, came back in, dressed as a little girl with a different name. And the parents knew nothing about it and had their kids come home after that. It caused a little bit of an uproar, okay? And so... When the outraged parents complained to school administrators, the principal fell back on Rockland's non-discrimination policy and the supposed age appropriateness of the discussions. The parents' ire at the principal, and for that matter, even the school board was wrongly directed. The fault lies instead with the California legislature, and here's why. California, like 21 other states in the District of Columbia, requires schools to notify parents of their sex education curriculum. The Golden State also joins 35 other states in D.C. in requiring schools to allow parents to opt their children out of sex education. Um, but the California legislature specifically excluded gender identity from the state's notice and opt-out requirements by providing in Section uh, 51932B of the Education Code, this chapter does not apply to instruction, instructions, materials, presentations, or programming that discuss gender, gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, discrimination, harassment, bullying, intimidation, relationships, or family, and do not, or, and do not discuss human reproductive organs and their functions. So they can talk all about what, whether somebody um, should be a boy or a girl, or whether they should pick it, or whether they should be androgynous, and all that kind of stuff. As long as they're not talking about parts, they don't have to tell the parents. It's basically what that comes down to. Coming to a school ne near you. This is Washington State. And these are uh, proposals. Actually, th this, is, this is already um, codified. And these are topics. Um, and this is what this means. That these are um, recommended topics for teachers in these grades. Um, these topics can be adopted by a local school board or they can be ignored by the local school board, which is a good thing and they can even be ignored by individual teachers. But these are the topics that Washington State recommends. And so in kindergarten, what they want the kids to understand is that there are many ways to express gender. So if a teacher wants to teach that, that's what they get to tell, tell your kindergartner. Um, explain in grade one, again, that there are many ways to express gender. In grade two, understand there is a range of gender roles and expressions. And so, you know, it's not just two. Um, in grade three, explain again that gender roles can vary considerably. And um, in both those grades, understand the importance of treating others with respect regarding gender identity. Be nice to people is a good thing. Um, in grade four, identi identify how friends and family can influence ideas regarding gender roles and demonstrate ways to show respect and define sexual orientation. In grade five, Describe how media, society, and culture can influence ideas regarding gender roles, identity, and expression. Promote ways to show respect for all people. And I really love this one. Identify trusted adults to ask questions about gender identity and sexual orientation. How do you think that'll go? So if I got a fifth grader, and am I one of the trusted adults? Because I think that there are two genders, male and female. So am I trusted? Anybody who's teaching this doesn't trust me. Okay, this is a this is something that um, uh, came out of my home state, um, California, um, and this is another one of those graphs. This is a, a study by UCLA, and they ask California adolescents 12 to 17 um, what their gender conformity level was, 
And so 73%, that's this, this cut of the pie, um, were gender conforming. Boys thought they were boys, girls thought they were gr girls. Um, androgynous, we could go either way, 20.8%. And highly gender nonconforming was 6.2%. This is transgender. 6.2% of kids 12 to 17, okay, in, in uh, California. How many adults identify as transgender in the, transgender in the United States? This is from the, the same year, 2015. And so United States of America, and they break it down by state, but United States of America, 1,397,000 uh, of the population said that they were transgendered. That's 0.58%. So less than 1%, almost half a percent of people in the United States believe that they're transgender, while kids in California, 27% of them think that they're either transgender or that they could be. Where'd that come from? And again, what you, what you have is anarchy. You have, you have people going all kinds of different ways on stuff, and you know, you're, you're tearing apart the family, and it's just a mess. The last step when you get to this is judgment. And basically what the world wants to tell you is don't panic about America's cultural decline. I loved this article. Don't panic. Everything's fine. This is what the, this guy said. We're always assuming our civilization is on the verge of collapse. Obsession with decline and with dystopia dates back to the Puritans. Guess what they think I am. Uh, it's even stimulated those who study them to invent something called the declension theory. The theory suggests that new generations are almost destined to go astray, to allow standards to fall, to, to destroy all that it took so many previous generations to build. Cultural decline, in other words, is as American as apple pie. It goes on and speaks on vulgarity in society. It says it, um, it intersects rather than opposes civilization being not so much an alternative as an almost natural extension or outcome of all that is civilized. A glorification of ego anywhere, everywhere, and always. In his 1940 essay, Vulgarity in Literature, Aldous Huxley described it as a lowness that proclaims itself. And the self-proclamation is also intrinsically a lowness. It is therefore almost ubiquitous and probably inescapable, wherein every greatest king and every loveliest flowery princess and every poet most refined, every best-dressed dandy, every holiest and most spiritual leader, there lurks waiting, waiting for the moment to emerge, an outcast of the outcasts, a dung carrier, a dog, lower than the lowest, bottomless, bottomlessly vulgar. Huxley, for all we know, was playing a joke on his readers by suggesting that society resigns itself to such vulgarity, including his own. It needn't do this, of course, but what other choice does it have? The Dutch biologist and thinker Midas Deckers has offered one in a more recent book, The Way of All Flesh. Celebrate decay and therefore decline. It's only natural, so why bemoan it? He's correct to insist that life is a way of dying slowly. He is also persuasive, for decay may be putrid, even ugly to some people, but is dense, intricate, and deeply powerfully alive. Decadent eras can be exciting. So, don't conflate the vulgar with the primitive. Don't fight decadence and decay. Embrace and relish them. The surviving Puritans among us may well object, but even their culture won't last forever in America. So don't worry about it. And that's, that's where I'm going to end because I got a bunch more. In any case, we have, we have some stuff that, that's going on um, and not just the cultural issues in the, in the, in the sense of vulgarity and sexual immorality and even confusion on gender identity and all of these things that are going to end up wrecking lives left and right. It's not only that, but we've, we've got situation that, situations where people are literally at each other's throats. And that's the, that's the next step that I was going to point out. And so I'm going to point, you know, do, I've got some stuff on Antifa. I've got some stuff on uh, Black Lives Matter. I've got some stuff on the KKK in Charlottesville, that kind of stuff. And we've got these situations where people are literally beating the snot out of each other. And I know that they're all extremists. I know that. Um, but we, we've, we've uh, again, got situations where people are gunning up. They're gunning up. They're going out and getting guns. And it's not just... Um, you know, uh, right-wing white nationalists that are, that are doing it. Got left-wing people in our country that are doing exactly the same thing. And um, it's getting to be a pretty scary situation when you've got politicians that have no common ground, 
no common ground at all in a two-party system. You've got a mess. And again, this, this has to do with uh, cultural decline, and it's all stuff that was prophesied in Scripture. We're living in times where the culture has to go downhill. And like I said before, you know, on the one hand, um, I, I look at what we've got around us, and, uh, and I'm pretty concerned about it. I pray, I pray for my country all the time because I don't like where things are going. And, but on the other hand, you know, like I said, when, when I saw that video with the, uh, with the whole demonstration of privilege, I was really encouraged. I was really encouraged because it, it can all turn around quickly. And so I can't change all of the United States. I, I don't have the ability to do that. But I can change lo- individual lives who are around me. I bring somebody to Jesus, and what's going to happen is immediately they themselves are going to be purified. Immediately what's going to happen is God's going to take them, and he's not, he's not going to change them from the outside in. He's going to change them from the inside out. And their heart is going to change, and their mind is going to change, and they're going to start getting some things squared away, and they're, go- they're going to stop being selfish. And they're going to start being centered on other people, like their family and their kids and their parents and their friends. They're going to be, they're going to start being centered on somebody else. And that immediately changes the, the, the culture that's around them, even without anyone getting saved besides that one person. And then other people around them get saved and it just, it just magnifies everything and it goes out and and it turns whole families around. And it's a really cool thing. Like I said, I was really encouraged by it because I like it that my, you know, that my son would have been out in front. I like it. And I'm not, a, I'm not ashamed of it. I think that's how everybody should be. I think that's how every family should go. And so, you know, um, I, I think this, this stuff can turn around really quickly. And it's not just by preaching family. It's by pre- preaching Christ. Jesus is the one who changes our lives. Jesus is the one who turns things around. And so um, ultimately, you know what? When I read my Bible, I know where the world's going. And it gets scary that, you know, that, that things look like they're happening so quickly and uh, that, the, that the trend seems to be downward and that whole thing. But again, you know, the Christians in Rome um, during the time of Paul, it, it was less than 20 years. And the Romans were saying they've turned the world upside down. And all it takes is going up to people one-on-one, telling them about Jesus, living a real lifestyle in front of them, bringing them into a knowledge of the Lord, showing them how to walk it, and everything turns around, and at least for that person. And so I can't do any, you know, every, anything about everybody else, but I can do something about the person who's right in front of me. heard a story about a guy this one time who was walking down the, down the uh, um, seashore, and um, he saw, you know, there was a bunch of starfish that had been washed up on the on the beach and you know they're going to the sun's going to come out they're going to die he's out there in the morning and so um you know there were a lot of them and so he's he's walking up to each one he picks one up and he throws it back in the water and a guy comes walking up to him and he goes what are you doing and he goes well saving starfish and he goes what do you how do you think that you're going to say look at down the beach there's thousands of them how do you think it's going to make a difference and he picks another starfish up and he goes, it's going to make a difference for this one. Tosses it in the water. And that's what I think about evangelism. You know, I may not be able to reach my whole country, but I can reach the people who are closest to me. I can reach the people who will listen to me. And I may not be able to save everyone, but I, you know, at least some people I can point to Jesus. And it's the same thing with every single one of us. There's probably about 800 people in this room. I, I just did some figures. You know, with a thousand people leading one person to Christ, Within eight years, everybody in the metropolitan area of the Tri-Cities is saved. Within eight years. And obviously, people have a free will. I know that. But that's how the numbers work. So one person leads, you know, one person per year. You lead one person per year to the Lord. And that person does exactly the same thing. Within eight eight years, it's over 250,000 people get saved. If you do it to people, it's within five years. If you do it with one person, within 19 years, actually it's within 30 years, within 19 years, all of the United States is saved, and within 30 years, all of the world is saved. And if it's, if it's two, people per, uh, two, two people per person, I lead two people to the Lord in a year, 
Within four years, all the Tri-Cities. Within eight years, it's all the United States. And within 11 years, it's the world. And that's, that's the way that multiplication goes. That's why Jesus says, he, he says that we need to go out and talk to people and we're to talk to them one-on-one. It's, a, it's to be that kind of thing. It's not, it's not group evangelism that Jesus called us to. It's one-on-one type of stuff. And if everybody in the room was looking at, at somebody in their life and this year was praying for them and led that person to the Lord, you'd, made a, you'd make a major impact. You'd, make a ma- you'd double this church, obviously, right? And I'm not even talking about everybody coming here. It's just the amount of people. You double it. And, you know, you do that a couple of years in a row, and it's, it makes a major impact. And that's, that's what God called us to. And so I'm encouraged um, by some of this stuff. I know, like I said, I know where it's going, and I know that, that this stuff can, be, can get scary and, and that kind of thing. But um, Jesus said that we're to occupy till he comes. And so you don't give up when you're getting close to the finish line. What you do is you pour it on. And so if you've been kind of coasting, that's not the way that you run a race. At the end of the race, you do more. You don't do less. And so it's something to keep in mind. So that's good. Let's pray. Jesus, thanks, thanks again for the time. Thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you for the, for the fact that um, you've brought us into a relationship with you. Actually, if you've brought everybody in here into a relationship with you, I don't know that. Um, Lord, there may be some people here who don't know you yet. They've never made a commitment to follow after you, you know, and maybe this is the, the first time they've even been in church or something. And uh, Lord, they, they don't know about, um, about what you have for them. You've said in your word that if we'll follow you, that you'll do exceedingly abundantly above the, all that we could ask or think. You've said in your word that if we would follow you, that you would forgive us for our sin and that you would cleanse us from the inside out. Um, Your word says that when you went to the cross, that you died on that cross to replace us, that I deserved to go to the cross and you deserved to go to heaven and what you did was traded places with me. And you did that with everybody in this room, whether they've accepted you or not. And then you said that if we would call on your name, that you would save us, that if, you, that if we would receive you, um, that you would come into our life, that you would make us part of your family and that we would be forgiven and we could know that we, that we know that we're going to heaven. And Father, I just want to pray for anybody here that doesn't know that, that that's never experienced that. Maybe they've gone to church all their life and they've, they've never committed their life to you. They've never, there's never been a time where they said, Jesus, I want you to be in control of my life. I want to be a Christian. I want to be somebody who follows you. And Father, I, I just pray for anybody that's here like that, that you would um, reach out to them, that you would touch them, Lord, and that you would help them to make a decision to follow you. I'm going to give you a chance to do that right now. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. If you're here this evening and you don't know if you're going to heaven, you don't, you don't know if Jesus came back today or if you died today, that you would go to heaven. You don't know if your sins are forgiven. You don't, you don't know if you're a Christian. And, you know, with some of the stuff that we've been talking about, maybe you've had a mindset that is actually something that's opposite than what the Bible has to say, just from reading verses that I just read tonight. And so you're sitting there questioning whether or not you even know the Lord. You can have a relationship with God right now. God can change everything for you right now. You know, I was talking about changing a family. And what God did was he reached out to a punk kid, that's me, and brought me into a relationship with him. And I was a punk after I got saved too. But he changed me and he made me into something different, something I never thought I could be. And he could do exactly the same thing with you, exactly the same thing. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter what you've done. Jesus paid for your sin. And so if you'd like to receive Christ, if you'd like to give your life to him, you'd like to know that you're a Christian, know that you're going to heaven, if you'd like to be forgiven, if that's you, why don't you raise your hand up and I'm going to pray for you. It's going to give you an opportunity. Back in the back. God bless you. Anybody else? Last moment. I've got to get you out of here. You have an opportunity right now to have your life completely changed. And if you'd like that, you can have it. Anybody else? Okay, you that raise your hand, you want to look up at me? 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray a prayer with you. And this is, a, this is a prayer asking Jesus to come into your life, okay? The Bible says that if you'll receive him, that he'll um, make you one of his children. And so if you would, why don't you, why don't you just pray right out loud with me this prayer asking Christ to forgive you for your sin and to come into your heart, okay? So pray this out loud. Lord Jesus, come into my life. I know that I'm a sinner. I sinned against you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please write my name in your book of life and make me a Christian. I thank you that you love me and you died for me and that you rose from the dead. Please fill me with your spirit and help me to follow you. I give my whole life to you now. In Jesus' name, amen.